Welcome back. MetLife scoring a huge victory this week for American taxpayers, and some would say the U.S. financial system. The insurance giant challenged their too big to fail status in federal court, and they won. A designation created when the Dodd Frank Act of 2010 law was signed. Now, other companies, including GE Capital, are following suit. The man who crafted the challenge is the son of the late Supreme Court Justice, Antonin Scalia. It is my pleasure to welcome to the program Gibson Dunn Partner and attorney for MetLife, Gene Scalia. Gene, it's so nice to have you on the program this morning. Good morning. Good morning. Pleasure to be here. First, I have to offer my condolences. Your father was such a great man. Uh, and we're going to talk you. about that coming up because he has such a Thank legacy. You. My condolences, Gene. Thank you for joining us this morning. Let me, let me ask you about this case because this case is so important, not just for MetLife, but for the entire industry. First off, tell me the argument that you crafted to make the case that, in fact, designating MetLife too big to fail or systemically important was uh, wrong? Uh, well, we made um, several different arguments, but uh, the heart of the case was that uh, under uh, any uh, regulatory framework, and no matter how powerful or important an agency, uh, there are obligations on the part of the agency to uh, give careful attention to uh, the evidence uh, that's before it, to uh, give a fair hearing to the arguments uh, that are made, and, uh, and also uh, simply to give fair process. And the uh, uh, thrust of our case was that uh, FSOC had relied too much on its own speculation, uh, that uh, it had not uh, paid sufficient attention to the evidence that MetLife put in showing that, in fact, it was not a systemic threat, and that also the government hadn't uh, given us uh, fair access to some of the information it was considering and the like. And, uh, and, and you know, it, this was not a challenge to the Dodd-Frank Act. Uh, I viewed it more as a vindication of the procedures and the substantive rules that Congress had put in there, which we argued the Financial Stability Oversight Council, or, or this agency called FSOC, hadn't followed. Yeah, no, I agree with you. I, I think, you know, this law has been debated ever since it was put, uh, put into law, frankly, because it's completely dictated, and it's also dictated balance sheets. I mean, you look at the fact that GE had to sell all of GE Capital uh, because they were also designated too big to fail. Characterize for us, Gene, the implications of this designation. When, when the government comes out and says, okay, look, you're an asset manager, you're too big to fail, people say, well, why would an asset manager be systemically important and how is that going to create chaos in the economy same with an insurance company so when you're deemed too big to fail or systemically important why is that an issue tell us what comes along with that designation gene well you know maria um, i've dealt with uh, a number of different federal agencies you know the labor department the securities and exchange commission the federal communications commission and i had no idea until getting involved in this case for metlife how extremely intrusive regulation by the Federal Reserve Board is, and particularly when you're being regulated as a big bank. It's really another world in terms of the burdens. So once it was designated, uh, MetLife had um, nearly a dozen uh, federal bank examiners uh, on its premises on a full-time basis examining its books and records, uh, providing uh, their views about uh, changes that ought to be made, seeking to meet with uh, senior executives uh, quite frequently, and, um, and, and there were a range of new obligations that were being imposed, including uh, potentially most important that uh, MetLife was going to be subject to increased capital rules uh, so that uh, although most of uh, its competitors in the insurance business uh, would not be subject to those requirements for MetLife to uh, uh, receive a certain level of income, it was going to have to hold much more capital than its competitors. That was going to be bad for the shareholders of MetLife, obviously, and, um, and, 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 and for the customers as well. So it was a really uh, onerous burden to be designated. And one of the remarkable things about the government's case was it actually argued in court that there had been no effect on MetLife. Uh, by being designated. But that was plainly untrue. And yeah. You give the example, for example, of what happened with GE. Right. I mean, it's plainly untrue. You see GE Capital uh, being sold because of this. You see AIG, Hank Greenberg, right, pushing back, suing the government. There, there was so many cases and so much pushback from the private sector because of the implications of that designation. So, Gene, give us the timeline now. What happens next? This, 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 is, uh, this obvious court ruling is a big victory for MetLife, big victory for your work, obviously. Uh, what's the timeline, and how do we follow this in terms of the next catalyst? Uh, well, 
Uh, it's already been uh, reported that uh, the uh, Federal Reserve now has uh, ceased its uh, regulatory oversight of MetLife. And, um, you know, uh, my hope is that uh, uh, this is uh, the end of this proceeding, that uh, MetLife will continue to be regulated as it has been for so long by uh, a very thorough state regulatory system uh, and, and, and by certain federal agencies for uh, relevant activities like the Securities Exchange Commission. Uh, one thing the government will be considering is whether to appeal. They have 60 days. And, uh, you know, and I've been there, Marie. I've been a, a, a government for the lawyer. My hunch is that the government lawyers are sitting down with FSOC and talking through some of the mistakes that FSOC really did make in this proceeding and explaining uh, that although they may be very uh, uh, upset about the loss and, and that, they, that they are interested in appealing, that, uh, that they did make some what I would call rookie, rookie mistakes in how they uh, handled this proceeding. And if they choose to appeal, which obviously is their right, there certainly is some risk that the appellate court actually would rule for uh, MetLife on even additional grounds. We won on three of the ten we raised. We could win on more. And, of course, a court of appeals decision would be uh, an even more important binding court precedent. So I think those are the kinds of things they're weighing now. Yeah, I mean, I can't, uh, I can't emphasize how important this case really is enough because it's not just about MetLife, but this is an opportunity for the rest of the financial services industry to, to know that it's okay to push back. You pointed yeah, out those you know, rookie mistakes. Could, it's very important. Yes, go ahead, Gene. Right, just to comment briefly on that, when this case was filed, there was this myth out there that uh, the agency had pretty much unfettered discretion to do what it wanted to do and, uh, and, and that you can't fight City Hall. So, yeah, this case is important to MetLife, but I think it's really important for corporations generally and, frankly, individuals generally as a reminder that the government is also subject to the rule of law.